This is Twit. Intel, April 23rd, Tuesday this week, Intel announced, uh, give or take, 49,000 new processors. Uh, it was an unusual announcement, even by Intel's uh, standards, because I, I want to say there was upwards of 20 new uh, ninth gen uh, mobile processors, right? This is the 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 you know we had the desktop processors this fall the mobile processors came out a lot of the the news a lot of the excitement was all around this crazy new um, i9 9980HK um, which is running eight cores sixteen threads at up to five gigahertz I think personally is going to be a cooling nightmare no matter how giant uh, your laptop is. Uh, and some of the stuff they were describing on this, right? So these are essentially, you know, coffee-like updates. But um, one, the the core density on that processor must be kind of insane. Uh, oh, as yeah. we come to expect, you know, up to 18% higher frames per second, you know, compared to a laptop that you should have gotten rid of four years ago kind of stuff. Um, the, uh, <laughs> you know, the thing I think was most exciting for me about this uh, was one, looking at like Core i7s are now... You know, six core, 12 threads. And these are all 45 watt uh, uh, H series parts, right? So they're all premium, full size, uh, creative laptops, gaming laptops. But like i9s are eight core, 16 thread. Core i7s are six core, 12, 12 threads. Uh, core i5s are four core, eight threads. And uh, the, uh, you know, the, the power consumption on these is all 45 watts. Um, I was really excited about the fact that they now have support for up to 128 gigabytes of DDR4 memory, um, which is huge. Not Gamers don't need 128 megabytes of memory. Even most video editors don't need 128 gigabytes of memory. But for the applications that can actually take advantage of that, being able to put that in a mobile platform, uh, I think is a kind of a huge development. Uh, I also nerd out about that. Um, and then kind of, you know, if you look at this, this page, right? Uh, the video's rolling here. It's, you know, we have super cool graphics. Um, it's not like it's looking like a small part, but there was some of the, some of the stuff that was announced in this was kind of funny. Uh, you know, the, uh, where you, where is it? There's one line in there that just had me laughing in the announcements. Where did it go? Where did it go? Where did it go? Muscle books. So that oh, 9980 yes, HK yes. being quote fully unlocked for muscle books, you know, and then the 9980 H, which is locked for TNL and creator laptops. And I'm assuming TNL is a, it's transform and lighting, which would be a really bizarre way of saying gaming laptops, uh, or perhaps they're thinking of a new category of field rendering for, for people who make movies and, and stuff. Um, the, uh, you know, and then kind of in the shadow of this, they announced that they had another 25 laptop, excuse me, uh, another 25 desktop processors, you know, at the high end of $488, 3.6 gigahertz, 8-core, 16-thread Core i9. Uh, and they have versions with and without integrated graphics now, a ton of Core i7, Core i5, Core i3 parts, and then literally all the way down to 2-core, two 2-thread two Celeron starting at 42 bucks, and uh, 3 or 4, 2-core, four 4-thread four Pentium Gold CPUs. And those are priced between 64 and $86. Bucks. Um, you guys pointed out uh, that, that support for Optane memory is like universal on all the new processors now. Yes. Um, the, the Optane memory push, right? And then the Optane uh, memory H10, 16 and 32 gigabyte options with up to one terabyte of QLC NAND 3D storage or QLC 3D NAND storage. Um, so all of a sudden it seems like Intel's like, God damn it, we're putting Optane in everything. <laughs> we're going to get our money out of the development of this technology. Um, hey, I happen even to have SSD. the 512 gigabyte variant of it right here. This is the new so, focus. This is the H10... It has Optane, 32 gigabytes, and another 500 gigabytes of uh, QLC NAND on board. Is it going, I mean, how are you going to test that? How are you going to, is there, is there any easy or meaningful way of testing the performance on that compared to a standard SSD? Easy? Absolutely not. And this is where <laughs> I greatly miss a uh, former co-host of this program and storage editor at PC per Alan Malventano, who had his own... Uh, you know, testing methodology developed for Optane before he departed. But it in just trying to assess his performance from a real world standpoint, which I've been doing for the last right. few days, kind of in between other reviews, it's not 
cut and dry. It's it's very specific kind of use cases and scenarios where you'll see a big difference. The biggest mm -hmm. difference being you essentially you have two drives here. What's interesting about this product is it's two separate drives occupying one M.2 package where it's a right. PCIe Gen 3 by 4 but there are two by two devices on it and they're not linked in hardware. They actually show up if your device understands what this is, they show up as two separate devices in the disk manager. And when you use Intel's Optane software or the Intel SSD toolbox to create the Optane cache, it merges them, but it's all virtual. It's just in software and it's only supported under windows with the software. So it's, it's, difficult to assess it just you know head to head with other drives just because you have this ultra low latency cache that right. isn't necessarily all that fast and raw like throughput compared to really fast m.2 drives but it definitely does offset um slower qlc nan so the two combined make for a lot more of a compelling experience and especially does well with things running in the background is what I've seen. Like you can have a file copy going huh. and open up another application and it's as if there was absolutely no background activity because it shifts the new activity over to the Optane half and right. it allows the background activity to stay on the NAND. So that's interesting and it, it provides some really good uh, kind of multitasking, which is kind of what you'll be doing on a laptop, especially if it's like a work laptop. And this is a product that's only on OEM machines. There's no okay. retail availability of this yet. So anyhow. Part of I mean, part of what frustrates me about Optane at this point is one, SSDs have gotten so cheap. Two, uh, it's kind of bizarre because all of the management between the uh, the Optane memory on the M2 uh, uh, stick and the the QLC, the NAND, the main SSD on that, is all handled via software. Um, <laughs> so it's not doing it internally, which would seem to me me to be faster. And then literally it seems like what Optane is doing right now is just doubling up on what Windows does with your main system memory, which is to catch the cache, the stuff that you use the most often or that it expects you to use next. So, okay, so it's giving you a lot more space for that compared to 8 gigs of system memory or 16 gigabytes of system memory, depending on which Optane device you have. But, you know, it's... It, feels like it's turning into a, a weird sort of checkbox, you know, you know, with Optane memory, five gigahertz, more ponies, Optane memory, you know, in the sense of, of that it's, you know, you're not looking at this and going like, this is amazing. It makes everything better. It does it kind of be seem to, you know how, like you mentioned system memory, if you've opened up an application right. within a single user session, and then you close it or go back to it because it's likely still resident in memory. It's super fast. Like you open up an application twice during the same window session and it always opens up much faster the second time unless right. you've just completely used up all of your available RAM. And that's kind of what this does. Is it, it sort of bridges the gap. Like if you're on a fresh boot and it's something that you frequently access, it will kind of act like it's already there and available a little bit more than having to actually go fetch it from storage, but you're not going to see as big of a benefit from this if you're coming from a machine that already had a fast M.2 drive. This is more of like gonna right. it's going to blow you away if you're coming from spinning storage, but this is not something that's that's coupled with <laughs> but any SSD media. Yeah, any SSD will blow you away coming from spinning storage. Um, you, uh, I think you put in the the rundown. Uh, it was a really nice breakdown of everything that was announced on Anantech, and I read this article yeah. too. Um, one of the things is great where they start talking about all of the various suffixes now uh, in the Intel lineup. Um, you know, but scroll down. There's uh, where they subdivide their CPUs in two ways: the Core i series number. Scroll up a little bit. Uh, Thank you. Uh, Core i9, eight cores with hyper-threading. Core i7, eight cores, no hyper-threading. Core i5, six cores, no hyper-threading. Core i3, four cores, no hyper-threading. Pentium Gold, two cores, hyper-threading. Celeron, two cores, no hyper-threading. Um, and then each processor says Anantech, and I should give a shout-out to Ian Cutris on that one. Uh, K is overclockable. 
KF, the suffix, is overclockable with no integrated graphics. No suffix is a standard CPU, 54 to 65 watt TDP with integrated graphics. F is no integrated graphics, uh, as you would expect from KF. And then T is a low power 35 watt TDP. Um, so there's a ton of information inside of there. But I'm looking at this. There's one, two, three, four, I9, one, two, three, four, five. So five core i7, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine core i5, and then one, two, three, four, five, six, seven core i3 processors. Um, I got to be honest with you. I really, 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 really want to see what the thermal uh, thermals are going to be like or what they have to do to keep an eight core, 16 thread, you know, part that's running at a base frequency of 3.6 gigahertz and supposed to turbo up to five gigahertz. I really want to see how they keep those cool um, yeah. in laptops. I mean, I said 40, screaming fans and massive cooling systems. 45 watts is no joke anyway to dissipate. Yeah. And then I know the five gigahertz number is just single core boost. So for just very quick, bursty, single-threaded type workloads, you might be hitting that, but I can imagine most of the time, right. if you're multi-threaded at all, you're going to be significantly closer to that base frequency. I just want to see them actually hit the base, stay at the base frequency. And I, I admit, I'm sensitive to this because a friend of mine freaked out because he bought a new $3,000 Surface Book and was like, it's slow. And because it was passively cooled, now I, nobody's going to put a 45-watt part and a passively no. cooled laptop. Um, but it, it just because it was passively cooled, it was considerably, you know, I remember having like a, an XPS 13 alongside this this laptop. The XPS 13 was like two years old, had a Core i5, sold for $1,000, and was running certain tests like 25% faster than the Surface Book. You know, if you were, you know, uh, it's, it, it's just amazing to see how dense these parts have gotten at this point. Uh, or at least it feels that way. 